Paris, France. Professor, Professor Solova research interest is in the, is in organic chemistry, biological and supramolecular glycochemistry. And his current research is in regioselective functionalization of cyclodextrins, catalysis with confined metal complexes, supramolecular hierarchical assemblies, and sugar <laughs> mimesis. Uh, he'll be speaking on selectively modified cyclodextrin for bio-inspired applications. Thank you, uh, Professor Matthew Sologov. Uh, now the mic is on you. To Thank you. Talk. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Naveen. It's uh, it's a great uh, idea to have this uh, e-seminar. It's my first uh, webinar, actually, so I'm, I'm really uh, grateful to you for this opportunity. So yes, we will speak today about what we are doing with cyclodextrins in Paris, in Sorbonne, uh, and, uh, and and how we can use them to to uh, and use nature to get inspired to get some applications. All right, so um, I don't know why it doesn't work. Oh. Let me see. Oh, yes. Okay, sorry. All right, so cyclodextrins, they are part of a wider family of compounds which are called the cyclic concave molecules. So those molecules are really at the root of supramolecular chemistry uh, because they have this, this, uh, this cavity. But cyclodextrin, they stand out of uh, this family of compounds because they are the only ones which are naturally occurring and uh, they are um, uh, water soluble. And also they are very cheap and used in our daily lives. So why are they used in our daily lives? It's because of this structure. So that there exists three main categories of cyclodextrins. Uh, they are cyclic oligosaccharides, which have either six, seven, or eight uh, glucose units. And so they are called alpha, beta, alpha, beta, and gamma uh, cyclodextrins. So you can see that uh, those uh, cyclodextrins, because they are sugars, they have all those OH groups. I don't know why it's dipping. Hmm. Oh, it's interesting. It doesn't want to do anything. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, I'll, I'll try again. Uh, I don't know. Oh, yeah, okay. I don't know why it stops, but anyway. So I was saying that uh, those cyclodextrin, they, they got, oh, and now it does work. Okay. Bon, not clear why it stops and why it goes. Uh, so the cyclodextrin, they have uh, OH groups uh, in the outside of the cavity and they define either a small ring here called the primary ring because they are uh, made of the, the primary hydroxyl groups or the secondary ring here made of the secondary hydroxyl groups. So the cyclodextrins, they are uh, soluble in water, but inside of the cavity, they are full of uh, CH, uh, CH groups, which makes the interior of the cavity very hydrophobic. So that makes that those molecules are water soluble but in the presence of a hydrophobic moiety, of a hydrophobic molecule in water, they make those uh, host guest complexes because they can complex the, uh, uh, the, the hydrophobic molecule. And, and this is at the root of all the uh, applications of uh, cyclodextrin. In our daily life, I was, as I was saying, like uh, in deodorants, as deodorants, you can you are using probably without knowing it cyclodextrins, and they capture deodorants in this manner. Okay, so just uh, looking at this uh, at this mechanism of uh, complexation, many people as early as in the 1960s, and mainly Ronald Breslow, I would say, 
he realized that maybe that was the first, like the first step of a recognition of a molecule uh, by an enzyme. It looked like that. And he thought that he, he just needed to add a, 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 a stimulus to convert this a yellow uh, ball into a red ball, so do a, a chemical transformation, and then maybe the red ball would be released. So if you look at that, this is really like a, an enzyme mimic. You could, you could think of the cyclodextrin as being an, an artificial uh, 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 active site of an enzyme. So what do we need uh, to add to this cyclodextrin for, for this transformation to occur here? It's functional groups. And um, and strangely enough, this beautiful idea, this uh, beautiful area kind of died out after the 1980s and uh, early 90s. And why is that? We think, uh, I think at least, that uh, the reason is the uh, formation of functional cyclic extremes. For example, here you have a beautiful example by Ronald Breslow of uh, the synthesis of a very beautiful artificial enzyme. You see you've got a, a cofactor analog here, uh, the pyridoxamine, and here you've got the diamine to position the substrate perfectly like in, a, like in an enzyme site. But to make, to make it, as you can see here, it looks like not that difficult, 60% yield from this diode, diiodo compound. But no, it's not 60% yield, it's 15% yield of a 6 to 4 mixture of regioisomers. So you see, it's already very difficult because you already have, you have a very low yield. You have to purify regioisomers, very difficult to purify. I mean, we just saw uh, TLCs in the previous uh, talk. Well, the TLCs here are even worse. And what's worse is that if you want to synthesize this base iodo compound, you have to uh, make a bridged compound. And if you look at the reference for this bridged compound, this bridge compound is also made in 20% yield as a mixture of regioisomers. So you would understand that clearly the difficulty here is uh, the uh, synthesis of functional cyclic streams. Okay, some time ago uh, in, in the lab with Pierre Sinai, we developed a debentilation reaction on, on sugars, actually on simple sugars, and we applied it to cyclic extremes. And we found that we could very efficiently, uh, radioselectively deprotect two uh, benzyl groups situated on the primary rim of the cyclodextrin and situated um, uh, diametrically opposed to each other. You see, very, very efficient, high yield, high radioselectivity. And also, what I should add is the fact that the cyclodextrin is benzylated that makes everything so much easier because it's more practical. You can do the reaction in toluene as a solvent and not in very polar solvent. And you can do the purification in silica gel chromatography and not on HPLC as you would do in the Breslow case. And you can do it on large scale. We do it like on 20 gram scale in my lab every week or so. Oh, sorry. <laughs> so one thing here is that, uh, okay, it's, it's just the addition of one function twice. And if you remember the work by Breslow, he added two different functions to have a very nice um, control of the reaction. So uh, what we, we, we tried then to do in the, the past uh, decade, let's say, is to develop uh, differentiation, hetero functionalization of cyclic swing, adding two or three or, or more different functions on the cyclic swing. So to do so, we understood a few things. We understood that this double deprotection, uh, sorry, was was a stepwise mechanism. So you can do the mono deprotection, stop the reaction here, isolate this mono, and introduce it back into the reaction conditions and get the diol. So that means that the uh, second deprotection is oriented by the first one. And what happens here is that when you put this alcohol in the presence of dibal H, you produce hydrogen and you form the aluminum oxide, the oxygen aluminum covalent bond. And here you produce very large uh, steric hindrance and the next aluminum reagent can only come as far as possible from the first one, which is on the diametrically opposed sugar. So by realizing that, we thought, okay, we'll just replace the OH group by something else that could also attach to aluminum. And here we replaced it 
by an azide. The azide is reduced. You form the nitrogen aluminum bond, steric hindrance, and you deprotect as far as possible on the diametrically opposed sugar. And here you see we have introduced in a very uh, radioselective manner two different groups on the cyclode extreme. Another thing that we uh, wondered was, uh, is it possible to duplicate the double deprotection? So to do so, we, we needed to find an R group that would be uh, stable to the action of Dibal. But if it's only stable and not orienting, then you would get a mixture of those two diodes. Yeah? So we, we, we wanted to, to go um, into uh, something which would be selective. And to do so, we, we uh, studied the mechanism and we showed that the first step of the mechanism involved the chelation of aluminum between those two oxygens. And you see, because of the structure of the cyclic extreme, because it, there are sugars here, because this CO bond here is oriented towards the left and the right hand side, sorry, the approach of this aluminum is hindered by the presence of this benzyl oxy group. Uh, while this benzyl oxy group seems very far away from the action. So, in, uh, so if we suppress this benzyl oxy group, we should favor the approach of aluminum here rather than here where it is uh, hindered by the presence of this benzyl oxy group. And indeed, that's what happens. If you suppress those two hydroxyls, you get, uh, uh, after dibal reaction, a double deprotection on the clockwise adjacent sugar here. Okay, so we've delineated uh, two orienting rules, either steric hindrance by attachment of aluminium on uh, this atom here orients the protection on a diametrically opposed sugar, or steric decompression orients the protection on the clockwise adjacent sugar. And uh, basically, we, this, these are all the patterns of functionality that you can access, that can you make with a, with a C6 molecule. These in red were those which were uh, accessible before our work. Now we have access to those. And uh, by uh, combining all our methods, we uh, finally, um, some five years ago, or five, six years ago, synthesized the cyclodextrin, as you can see here, with six different functions on its primary ring. So uh, we, uh, that was the situation when we started. And now that's all the patterns of functionality that are accessible. And arguably, if you get access to this cyclic screen with all different functions, it's just a matter of protecting group uh, manipulation and get access to all of it. So basically, we, 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 have, we have solved the problem of regioselective functionalization of cyclic screen. We can add as many groups as we want, of course, only on the primary ring, but still. So the question, of course, is why do we want to do that? Well, uh, I mean, what do we do here? We precisely position in space chemical function, yeah? So, and when you think about it, that's exactly what nature does with its uh, proteins. With its proteins, it puts functions uh, on a precisely positioned in space. And for example, for enzymes, that allows them to, to fold in a certain manner to give a shape, and the shape gives the function to the protein. And here for enzymes, it's catalysis. And um, those proteins, they can also interact with each other to make assemblies. And uh, those very complex and beautiful assemblies, they make different functions. And, and you can see here, for example, you have viruses. There are uh, supramolecular assemblies of proteins and, uh, and other things, of course, but uh, in viruses, it's often proteins. Okay, so this is one of my only slides with COVID-19, so I'm sorry, but uh, <laughs> that's how I could uh, relate to that. Okay, so I'll give you uh, uh, examples of what we do with this uh, in these two areas. Uh, enzyme mimicry with our compound. So the idea is to add, to, to, to get inspired by the nature uh, and how does nature induces selectivity with shape. So to give you an example, here we've got two uh, zinc carbopeptidases. So the same, uh, th those molecules, have the same mechanism and they, uh, uh, they catalyze the same reaction, which is the uh, hydrolysis of an amide bond. Uh, you see here and here. But in this case of this protein, it hydrolyzes the release of a C-terminal lysine from a polypeptide. And here it uh, induces the cleavage of an alanine-alanine uh, inside a polypeptide. So the same reaction 
the same zinc, the same, the same uh, metal to, to promote the reaction, but two different substrates. And of course, the difference is the shape of, you can see here very different shapes of the protein that induces the selectivity. So what we wanted to see, is, is it possible to add a metal to the cyclodexrin and to induce different shapes and different selectivities? Okay, so adding a metal to a cyclodextrin has been done uh, by many people before us and uh, even by Breslau in the, seven, in the, the 70s. Uh, and, um, but you see here the metal was always placed at the entrance of the cavity. Yeah, and, and the idea was to let the substrate come in, interact with the cavity to be recognized to uh, emulate this, uh, the, the, the enzymatic um, behavior. The, the problem, the inherent problem of this strategy is that you can have, you still have the possibility for the substrate to go from the outside and you lose some selectivity. So we wondered if it's possible to, to cap the cyclic screen not with a metal but with a ligand and to put the metal right in the middle and then the, the substrate will have to interact both with the cavity and the metal to, to, to react. So the question was, can we have metalloenzymes and can we vary the shape and therefore the selectivities? So to make those things, we synthesized the uh, NHC cyclodextrin, so n heterocyclic carbenes, which are very good ligands for metals, uh, in a very simple manner. From cyclodextrin, we do a benzylation, double debenzylation, we get the diol, then we, we mesylate, and then we cap with imidazole. And the imidazole ion that we form is a precursor to this NHC, to this carbene um, compound, which is very uh, useful. You can make uh, a lot of uh, metallic complexes. So for example, we made more, but let's uh, stick with alpha and beta uh, cyclodextrin. So you see, we've got the same structure of, uh, of complexes, but here we've got an additional sugar. That is the only difference between the two. And then we wondered if we had difference in shapes and selectivity. Okay, so we calculated the shapes. We did NMR studies. Now we've got X-ray st uh, studies also. And you see here that the shape of both our uh, 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 silver or copper complexes, uh, alpha uh, cyclohexane, beta cyclohexane. So you can't see really the difference of shape here because of those sticks. But if you convert the sticks into connolly surfaces, like to mimic enzyme viewing, well, you can see there is very different. They are very different in shape. You can see that the metal in this alpha cyclohexane is deeply encapsulated. You see some uh, helicity here. You see it's flat here and it's uh, steep here. In the cyclodextrin, beta cyclodextrin, here you've got some kind of a pit. The, the metal is most, more accessible. You've got a wall here, so it's only accessible from one side, and you still have some helicity uh, in this place. So uh, if you compare that with alpha and, oh, sorry, with alpha and beta cyclodextrin, which are not functionalized, you see they are very round, they are very symmetric, and so, uh, we did induce a, a very big change of shape by, by this capping. So the question was, do we induce some selectivity? So we did some, uh, for, for example, gold catalyzed reaction. And you can see that we can induce uh, uh, up to 80% of uh, enantiose selectivity, which is not great. But we wanted to see if it was our shape that induced this selectivity. So the mechanism of the reaction is the activation of the triple bond by, by gold and then attack of this double bond on, the, on this triple bond. And so if you represent just by hand, the triple bond activated by the, uh, the metal here, where uh, it is the flattest position, and then you see that the double bond can approach from this side or this side. And you can see that in the green approach, the, this uh, phenyl is next to the, the uh, more the flatter position of the um, uh, catalyst, and here it's ne next to, to some kind of a wall, so it's more difficult. And indeed, this approach gives the major uh, enantiomer. So we, we could increase enantio selectivity in, in another reaction. It is called an alkoxy cyclization reaction, also catalyzed by, water, uh, by uh, gold. And uh, so we went up to 94%. So, of course, when you speak about cyclodextrins, everybody asks you, well, did you do the reaction in water? But here you can see that our compound is uh, not soluble in water. Every reaction is done in organic solvent because of benzyl protection, as, as sugar chemists, uh, most of you, you should know. 
So to, to make them soluble in water, what we had to do was to convert the benzyl groups into methyl groups, and then they are very soluble in water. So we, we did the, the same uh, uh, reactions as before. And as you can see, when you uh, do the reaction in, in chloroform, you've got good yields, but relatively low in anthroselectivity. And in water, you've got bad yields, but better in anthroselectivity. But this reaction was not uh, optimal. We also did the alkoxy cyclization as before. This time, interestingly, uh, cycl uh, alpha cyclodextrin is not reactive, but beta cyclodextrin, very good, uh, good yield and excellent in anthroselectivity for this uh, reaction. We also performed in water some uh, 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 regioselective uh, reactions. As you can see here, upon reaction here, um, I draw a relation here. You have either ac uh, access to uh, activation of this CH or this CH to make the product A or product B. And uh, with an, a standard NHC, you get a mixture of those two regioisomers. But when you use cyclodextrin, you can go up to nine, 80 to 5, uh, a ratio of 80 to 5 uh, are in favor of this product in terms of reduce-selectivity. So you see the, 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 the cavity really induces selectivity. So last thing about this, chemoselectivity. So the, the stereotypical uh, chemoselective reaction is, you know, uh, addition on uh, alpha-beta and saturated ketone. Uh, if you've got a 1,4 addition, uh, you get this compound. A 1,2 addition reduces directly the ketone, and of course, if you use copper, you operate, sorry, a 1,4 addition. So uh, we, we tried uh, this reaction with standard uh, NHC, get 1,4 addition of uh, hydride here. But if we use uh, alpha cyclodexrin, we get exclusively 1,2 addition uh, uh, with some inantioselectivity. When we use beta cyclodexrin, we get both 1,2 and 1,4 addition. And so we have here a complete control of the chemoselectivity of uh, this reaction. And this, again, I won't go into the details because I don't have time today, but this is really linked to the shape of the cavity, and we demonstrated that by, by calculations. So I hope I convinced you that cyclodextrin could be used as enzyme-like or metalloenzyme-like structure, and that we can control a lot of uh, different selectivities. So let me uh, finish so, by, with the third part of this talk with assemblies. So the idea is to try to use cyclodextrin as molecular bricks for complex self-assemblies and make complex architectures. So um, you know that nature uses self-assemblies and what is called hierarchical assemblies to make those beautiful architectures. So hierarchical self-assembly is basically assembly of assemblies. Yeah? And uh, you can see ribosomes, you can see microtubules, and viruses, and well, the uh, awful uh, COVID-19 is part of this, uh, this family of hierarchical self-assembled molecules. So the idea is to try to mimic this kind of, uh, of assembly. So uh, we were inspired by the tobacco mosaic virus because its assembly is quite simple. It's made of two molecules, a lot of protein subunits and a molecule of RNA. So the, the protein subunits, they self-assemble by themselves, make, making one or two rings. And only in the presence of the viral RNA, they make the very long, uh, the very long assembly, which makes the, the, the virus. And the virus is the size of the RNA. Yeah? So, so the RNA decides of the size of, of the virus. So we decided to try to mimic this kind of assembly. The idea is here by using cyclic swing, of course. The idea, as, you, as I told you, in the presence of hydrophobic molecules in, in water, the cyclodextrin can make the host gas molecule a complex. So if you attach a hydrophobic molecule to a cyclodextrin, you should be able to self-assemble them by uh, hydrophobic interactions, as you can see here. So the idea is to add a positive charge to uh, interact with uh, nucleic acids and to make a hierarchical self-assembly with cyclodextrins and nucleic acids on the model of the TMV virus. So first things first, we, we, we took quite, us quite a long time to, to, to do the first level to, to uh, design this molecule here. Why is that? Because this is quite a complex thing to make molecules self-assemble in the way you want. Because in theory, when you put a cyclodextrin or a hydrophobic cavity with a hydrophobic guest, you've got a lot of different possibilities 
for it to self-assemble. Not only the linear supramolecular polymer. You've got self-inclusion, you've got head-to-head -head dimerization that you want to avoid. So usually what you do is that you choose um, a, a, a hydrophobic mitee which is big enough not to be able to go through the small rim. As I told you, there is a small and a big rim on the sacred extreme. So we did that. And unfortunately, we always got this self-included compound. Although this was big, too big to go through the primary ring. So how come that we still had self-inclusion? Well, uh, it's a mechanism that some, uh, some people uh, are looking at, have, have, have proposed, and, and we also propose that. We think that the sugar that is bearing the uh, hydrophobic molecule is, uh, um, is, a, a cell, is tumbling and inducing the self-inclusion. And of course, once you have that, it's finished. You cannot go back because this is a thermodynamical peak and, and you can't do anything with that. So uh, how, do we, uh, how do we fight self-inclusion? We fight self-inclusion uh, in our case because we know how to polyfunctionalize cyclic streams. We decided to, to bridge the cyclic string and to attach the, the hydrophobic molecule to the bridge and in this way, you prevent tumbling, you prevent dimerization through uh, the primary rim, and you induce only linear supramolecular polymerization. So the, the molecule that we made, it's, the synthesis is uh, six steps from beta cyclic screen. You see, you get our famous diol, carbon dilated diol, then oxidation, reductive amination bridges the cyclic screen. And then you, you put this, the, 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 the arm with a hydrophobic molecule here, and you deprotect and you get the compound. And so we proved by an MR, I won't go into the details, that we have the inclusion in the right direction here of the adamant pain. By DOZI, we show that we have a decrease with concentration of the coefficient diffusion, which is a sign of uh, polymerization. You see here for uh, self-inclusion or for molecules without adamant pain, you don't have this uh, um, decrease. And so we did make those, uh, uh, those polymers. So next step was to try to see if we had some interaction with, with DNA. So uh, among different uh, techniques, we used uh, electrophoresis. And the idea was to, is to put uh, 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 nucleic acids here and to add an increasing quantity of our molecule. And if we have interaction, we should prevent the migration of uh, DNA. And indeed, if you look here, uh, if you put a cyclic string who cannot self-assemble without because it doesn't have the adamant pain, you don't prevent migration. But with our self-assembling molecule, we do prevent uh, migration when, uh, with concentration. So that means that this molecule indeed interacts with DNA. So that's what we wanted to prove. But then, uh, of course, we were inspired by a virus. So the question was, do we have the function of a virus? And the function of a virus is to be able to transfect, which is to introduce uh, nucleic acids inside cavity, uh, inside a cell, and then to uh, interact with the genetic material of uh, this cell. And uh, we proved, uh, again, I don't have time to go into the details, that this molecule does not induce transfection, but only toxicity. This line is toxicity here. While this molecule is not toxic, but you can uh, reduce the expression of a gene uh, if you increase the quantity of this molecule. Um, so it's uh, dose dependent, um, and that, that means that we do have uh, a transfection. So the last question of this talk is that, okay, we have interaction, we've got function of a virus, but do we have the shape of a virus for this, uh, this uh, hierarchical complex? What is the shape of this complex? So we did cryo-TEM, which is, you know, you freeze a water solution of your uh, sample, and then you look uh, uh, at it by um, electronic microscopy. So that's, that's the, the, the cryo-microscopy of the, uh, the DNA. So we use very small pieces of DNA, uh, 18 mers, so 6 to 7 nanometers. We cannot see anything, it's too small. Here, uh, this is our uh, self-assembly alone. And again, we don't see it because it's too small and the, the, the contrast is not good enough. Then we mix them. And as you can see, we don't have anything. Okay, very disappointing. But in any case, we thought maybe because, well, th th 
not enough cyrene. And uh, Pierre Evnaud, the, the student that was doing that, increased the, the, the quantity of cyrene, and suddenly he started to see beautiful fibers. He did it again, and even more fibers uh, were seen here. And, uh, and we, of course, without the self-assembling ability to, of the cyclic swing, without the adamantane sphere, we did not get any fibers. And so the question was, really, what, what, what is this, uh, what is, how do they assemble? You see, we did some uh, high-resolution cryo-TM, so better resolution as before. And uh, in particular, on this, on this slide, you can see here, they all have the same diameter. They're completely homogeneous in diameter. So this is very remarkable because we make always the same assembly, at least in diameter. And in fact, if you do the same experiment as that, with the tobacco mosaic virus, ooh, they really look alike. So, so we didn't think so, completely honestly, but, but we did make a, a real uh, copy, or at least an analog or mimic of a virus with our compound of tobacco mosaic virus. And so we decided to go further and to try to, to get a 3D structure of that. So how do we do that? Well, we do like people did for, for, to reconstitute a, a 3D image of the Coliseum. People uh, collected uh, photographs of the Coliseum in uh, Rome, you know, this uh, famous uh, monument, on Facebook, so random pictures on Facebook, and then they, they, they reconstitute a 3D version of the Coliseum, and that's, what, uh, that's, that's the result. And basically, that's, that's the idea. What we take is that we take our micro, uh, uh, micrographs, yeah, the, the photos that we have from microscopy, we do pictures of our pictures. So you see all the little uh, uh, green squares here. I don't know if you can see that uh, are those of uh, our pictures that we take. Those pictures, we align them here to make them, uh, to, to align them basically. And then we categorize them in uh, classes of, of pictures, you see. And from 46,000 of photographs, we get four good classes which correspond to 18,000 of photographs. And from that, we do a reconstitution by applying a symmetry. So we tried C1 to C8 symmetry for those molecules. And the C7 was the most, uh, gave them the, the best result. That, that's what we get. And then we uh, try to fit our cyclic extreme inside the volumes. And you can see here, uh, when we, we fit, we, we insert the cyclodextrin and the DNA inside, in, inside the volume. That's what we get. If we get rid of the volume, that's what we get. We've got seven, uh, uh, seven rods, uh, seven pillars of cyclodextrins around a uh, 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 DNA here, which is included and protected from the outside by, by the cyclodextrins. So those little uh, rods, as you can see here, is this very complex uh, self-assembly of cyclodextrin and very well ordered as well. Uh, and, and I should add to finish is that, uh, in fact, I, I told you that TMV, uh, the, um, uh, the tobacco mosaic virus size was given by the RNA. In our case, our complex is even more complex because uh, here you see you've got a lot of pieces of small pieces of RNA. So you've got a, a, a higher degree of uh, self-assembly uh, in our case. So we're still prog progressing slowly. It's a very difficult task to understand how it works, why, etc., etc. So um, I hope you understood that uh, functionalization of cyclic extreme is, is key to uh, develop this field. And, and uh, I gave you so two examples in the catalysis field, how we can mimic metalloenzymes, and the uh, assembly field, how we can mimic the uh, structure of the self-assembly of simple uh, viruses. So let me thank uh, my group here in Paris, uh, the, the, my co-workers uh, and, uh, and, and the students, past and present students that, that uh, operated this work, the different uh, collaborations and uh, all the, the, um, the, 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 the fellowships I received. I'm very grateful to everybody. And uh, thank you to everybody. This is a uh, my university next to Notre Dame, as you can see, it's an old photograph because this has been destroyed by a fire in a very sad day. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Navin, for this opportunity. Thank you, Professor Solova.